Today, we're going to talk about how the behavior of these apologists who displayed some, some pretty crazy behavior is actually mandated in the Sharia. We're going to go through this in some detail to look at the specific doctrines that, that covers this. And you'll see there's a one-to-one -one correlation. And you'll see that they have taken it upon themselves as a duty to defend Islam. And this is actually how one does. So one does not dispute. One actually uses harsh language, insult, and ultimately threats, and then violence. So we will go through this, and I hope that any Muslims who respond, please don't just give us your opinions. I want to see actual scholarship from, you've got your four schools of fiqh, your four schools of law. Please provide us from the Sharia manuals and the fiqh manuals from these schools. Give us solid scholarly citations why you disagree. You know, let us see, let us check these manuals, and uh, that will be honest scholarship rather than me just saying no. Excellent. Uh, Aya, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, um, like as Adia said, I, I run a YouTube channel called The Third Apology. My name is Ayo. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm extremely excited just to get into this topic because uh, in, in all honesty, it's been overdue, but everything that's happened recently uh, with all the examples that we'll go through uh, will help you understand why we're talking about it now. Um, I just uploaded a video yesterday, in fact, about one of the uh, Muslim apologists that we'll see in particular. And so I'm glad that we're going to be able to see uh, not just their general behavior, but then we'll also be able to tie it through uh, Lloyd's presentation back to Islam's most trusted sources. And so, as he said, you know, keep keep an open mind and don't just dismiss it because you don't like the information. If you don't like the information, that's a good sign because you see there's something wrong with it. But you need to then uh, face the fact as to whether or not this is something that's truly taught within Islam or we're lying. And I think after his presentation today, if you're honest and intellectually honest, um, you'll have a much different perspective than you might have come in with for any Muslims watching. So that's my prayer and I'm excited to get into it. Excellent. Uh, links to both Lloyd and Ayo's channels are in the description box. As uh, Ayo mentioned, he just released a video yesterday on uh, Menj, one of the apologists we're going to be talking about. Uh, that video is off to a very quick start. Uh, it seems to be a major hit. So definitely check that out. Okay, so everyone, we have 37 slides and eight pages from a Sharia manual, a standard Sunni Islamic Sharia manual. We're discussing the doctrine of commanding the right and forbidding the wrong. This is effectively a foundational doctrine of Islam. Uh, you will not hear this discussed um, by Muslims, but it is fundamental to Islam, and we'll explain exactly what they say. But silencing critics of Islam with escalating threats and violence is standard Sharia law. It is not an aberration. It is perfectly normal. And if you watch some of my previous shows, you will see the parallels with the rest of Sharia law here. Right. So before we begin, I want to make a statement. We as Christians, I believe that we are often negligent in the study of Islam and we are deceived by Islam. So unlike the Bible, which stands alone, Islam relies on a web of authoritative texts, multiple texts from different scholars, multiple different books, dozens, hundreds of them. And this is very similar to the Mishnah and the Gemara that make up the Talmud, except their, their Talmud, the Islamic Talmud, the Sharia, is not found in a single book. It is distributed across multiple different books. So therefore we don't see it and we don't recognize it. Two, we are negligent because we fail to look beyond the Quran we fail to look beyond the Hadith into the Tafsi, which are written by major, major scholars, the Gospels of Muhammad, the Sira, and most importantly, we ignore the Sharia. Muslims are restricted by Sharia law to remain within the confines of the Quran only. They are meant to only view the Quran as a literal source. Christians, like good dummies, politely follow along with this idea, head in sand, and they drink the Islamic Kool-Aid. And we are deceived by this focus on an abrogated, vague, and contradictory Quran. And the Hadith are identical. The Hadith are abrogated. They're often vague. They're often contradictory. And the Hadith often cancel and abrogate the Quran and replace the Quran. So ignoring the existence and substance of Islam scholarly works, which is the Ijma, right? We miss the major source of Islamic authority. And this is the Ijma. In law, it is the third, and in practice, the most important of the sources of legal knowledge in Islam. It is the unanimous agreement of the community on a regulation imposed by Allah. 
right? Technically, ijma is the unanimous doctrine and opinion of the recognized religious authorities, the ulama, at any given time. Now understand that the ijma is derived, well, the Quran and the Sunnah combined made the Sharia. The Sharia is the spirit of the law, and that taken forward becomes the the fiqh, which is the application of the law. If any questions, please pop them into the comments, and I'll, I'll take it from there. We're going to be looking at the Umdat al Salik, right? The Reliance of the Traveler, which is the most well known and the standard Sharia reference in Islam. It's a classic manual, it is from the Shafi school. However, 85% or so of the doctrine is the same across all four of the Islamic schools. There are some differences, right? And these are for instance, do you want to be killed by whipping, killed by beating, killed by fire, or have you be beheaded? Either way, they all decided you're going to die, but how, that is what is the, vari the variable. It is the first translation of a standard Islamic legal text in a European language to be certified by al -Azhar. This is the most prestigious and the oldest Islamic seminary in the world. It turns out imams, and this is the most prestigious one in the world. So it has introductory material that form a guide to fiqh, which is the application of Islamic law of the Sharia. And then you've got the original works of the scholar Al-Misli. So this is derived from the founder of the school of Shafi jurisprudence, Shafi himself, who then, the book was then expanded by Nawawi, considered possibly the greatest scholar of the Shafi school, and then Al-Misri completed the book. Then we've got, it covers per personal ethics, character, and traditional Islamic Sufism. Don't be fooled, Sufism is critically important. In fact, the Sufis are the pinnacle of the Islamic scholars. They are the top echelon, the elite. And this also includes famous texts such as Al-Ghazali's Ikhya Ulum al-Din. Now this call, this is this book by Al-Ghazali is considered the number one scholar of Islam after Muhammad himself. He's the most famous of the Islamic scholars. Revival of the religious sciences is widely regarded as the greatest work of Muslim spirituality and is also regarded as perhaps the most widely read work in the Muslim world after the Quran. So we're looking at the best scholar and works derived from the most well-known book on Islamic spirituality. And of course, then we've got the Yad Salahin, which is one of the most famous of the Sira. So the book W consists of extensive notes and appendices, right? And then we've got biographies of hundreds of these scholars that are mentioned throughout the book, because as I said, it's a distributed web of references. And then, of course, some sections are left untranslated, like that of slavery. The scholar insists, Keller, who translated it, who is himself a Sufi, and Ghazali, the number one scholar in Islam after Muhammad, is also a Sufi. He decided not to translate the section on slavery. He said it's irrelevant to the modern day because it describes the rights and duties of slaves. However, slavery has never been abolished in Islam. It is still legal. And in fact, slavery in the Hadaya, which is 2,600 pages, comprises about 60% of that book. Any questions, Reno, before I go further? Uh, well, we do have a, a relevant comment in the chat from uh, Road FFM. He says, the normal Muslim is not interested in what is written in the Quran or Hadith. It's weird, I know, but it's the reality. Yeah. And then there was a follow-up question. Uh, so they do they just believe in what the Imams teach them? And yes, that's correct. And ultimately, it, you know, the Imams get the, the knowledge from the legal scholars and the legal scholars are not qualified to make their own opinions, really. Um, they can give opinions on new matters that haven't been decided before, you know, like how new technology applies to the roles, but they're kind of dependent on the ancient opinions. They're the most authoritative opinions and hence why the Sharia law is set in stone, so to speak. Right. And in fact, it's compulsory that Muslims obey the scholars that came before them. So for instance, these are some of the contents. You've got the warrants. Now these warrants are certificates of authenticity, which attest to the reliability. And the certificate of Al-Azhar says that this is a standard Sunni reference text that complies with all the tenets of Sunni Islam. So it discusses sacred knowledge and notice section B, the validity of following qualified scholarship. That section, that chapter actually says you are required, it's compulsory for Muslims to follow the scholarship of the Imams that came before the early Imams. And then it discusses a lot of things, purification, prayer, funeral prayer, fasting, fasting, pilgrimage, lots of interesting things. You've got Book O, Justice, which is a very interesting read. And of course, Book P, Enormities, another very interesting read. And then Section W, 
this is an eye opener. Good grief. That's some great reading there. But yeah, we're going to be looking at book Q, Commanding the Right and Forbidding the Wrong. There's a link in the show notes. Please download a copy and get reading. So we're going to discuss the obligation to command the right, which is a communal obligation. That's a legal term as opposed to a personal obligation. It's a general obligation that falls upon the entire Islamic ummah, the nation of Islam. And I don't mean that particular group. I mean, Islam, Islamic, well, members of Islam or adherence to Islam across the world, the ummah. And of course, they discuss levels of censure. In other words, when you have to silence critics or people who disobey the Sharia, the levels that you follow, this is the escalating scale that you have to follow. Situations where censoring is not obligatory, have these implying censure and so on. And we'll have a look at those specifics. Notice it says here in section Q 2.7, this does not include verbal abuse. They tell you it does not include verbal abuse. And then it tells you censuring with harsh words. So it includes verbal abuse, except it doesn't. So you must not use verbal abuse, but then it tells you here, use harsh words and then writing the wrong by hand, which includes intimidation, assault, and force of arms. It even has a section instructing you to take a gang of your friends and go and beat people up or break things. And then, of course, you have to be polite because that is obligatory. Any comments from you guys? <laughs> I mean, just looking at the, the the table of contents, so to speak, I, I already feel like this is going to be very interesting. So, um. <laughs> it's nuts. So yeah, Even yeah. Well, you know, we'll we'll hear from um, Muslims sometimes how you know Islam is such a polite religion, and you have to be really nice. It couldn't possibly be violent because you have to be polite, but. Here we see the, those two things side by side. It's like, you know, you get to redefine polite to be whatever you want it to be. It, it might be considered impolite to, to treat a kafir uh, in a respectful manner, for example. That is true. In fact, it disrespects Muslims because they're not dominant. So let's look into an example of how, of how the commanding the right and forbidding the wrong actually introduced. It's a low level form of jihad and how it actually is enforced with inside the Muslim community and it's even worse outside the Muslim community, but violence is endemic to Islam. So from the Reliance of the Travelers, section P75.22, the prophet said, were a man to look at you without permission and you threw a rock at him and you knocked out his eye, you would not have committed any crime. Wow. Muhammad said it. Is, it, is this, so, is this uh, assuming it's like a woman? Like if a woman does that and she kills a man? Or just anyone? Well, it doesn't specify. We'll look at the hadith and we'll start to look at the law. But yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting question. Mm -hmm. So this is the sharia and then the fiqh is the explanation and all the details and application to various situations. So we're a man to look at you. That's what it says. And then, of course, they go on to say, whoever peeps into a house without its people's permission, they may put out his eye. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, any thoughts from you guys? This is pretty blunt, I think. Yeah, it's, I think it's pretty straightforward. And already we see the, the extremities. Um, I'd, I'd be interested definitely just to see like more background behind this because it's so blunt, it's kind of hard to make exactly what situation it's being referred to. But still, even just reading it at face value, it's pretty interesting. Yeah, this is the Sunnah of Muhammad. So therefore it's not wrong. So anyway, so these hadiths, so it's derived from these hadiths, Sunan on the side. This one, we have Sunan on the side. So, the prophet said, if a person would you look at you without permission and you were to throw a stone at him and put out his eye, there would be no blame on you. In other words, you've not committed assault. This is not a crime. It was narrated, a Bedouin came to the door of the prophet and put his eye to the crack. The prophet saw him and intended to put his eye out with a sword or a stick. Right? And he said, if you had persisted, I would have put your eye out. And whoever looks, the prophet said, whoever looks into a house without permission of the occupants and they put out his eye, he has no right to blood money or retaliation. And this would be the law of retaliation, Kisas. And um, this is something that was, they drew from the old books on Judaism, the Talmud effectively, even though this has effectively been abrogated in Judaism. But Islam retained it. Any questions or comments then? It sounds like uh, Muhammad was just very crazy about his privacy. That's just kind of the impression I got. Like he just was crazy about his privacy. And the second someone intruded, he wanted to just be as extreme as possible. And then that was just adopted as... Sharia law, 
I mean, yep. obviously it's been abrogated, but still, uh, that's just kind of the vibe I get from. It's abrogated in Judaism. This is not abrogated. This is still persist. This is law. Oh, okay, okay. And, and uh, yeah. you know, well, even the the hilarious hadith about Moses um, taking a bath in private and then the stone running off of his clothes kind of says the same thing, right? Because all of the figures are really recast as images of Muhammad. So whatever Muhammad believed. You can see it in these other figures, in this case, Moses. So uh, clearly, uh, Muhammad was very private. He didn't want anyone to see him naked. And I guess people were probably making fun of him about that. Uh, we saw it in the, the serial literature that we looked at last week about how supposedly no one ever saw them naked or they'd go blind. And we can see it in that hadith. And we can see the same kind of ideas here. Right. So for instance, again, when you're praying in Islam and someone walks in front of you while you're praying, you are allowed to kill them. Wow. Right? So the, the prophet said, if someone passing in front of a person performing the prayer knew of the penalty for it, it would be better to, for him to wait for 40 or some say 100 years. Wow. Right? So if there is no barrier, if the person praying is further than a meter, then passing in front of him is merely offensive and the person praying is not entitled to push him. Just like they pushed Aisha, right? <laughs> if it is right, it is unlawful for anyone to pass between the person praying and such a barrier, even when there is no other way to pass. So if someone's praying, just wait, right? If someone tries to pass between you, if you're praying a barrier, they call it the sutra, right? So you're supposed to have a little, just a little, it could be a 30 centimeter tile list, just to say, look, I'm praying here. If he tries to pass between you, Gently push him back. If he persists, push him back as hard as necessary, as one would an attacker. Were he to die, one would not be subject to retaliation or have to pay an indemnity to his kin. So this is about prayer. And you, you are allowed to kill someone as if he had attacked you, if you're praying and he walks in front of you. And it's like if... if, if if you already see rulings this extreme just regarding someone walking in front of another while they're praying, I mean, just imagine how, they're, how extreme they're going to be when we get to insulting Islam or, you know, critiquing it or whatever it may be. I mean, it's going to be insane if this is how bad it is already. Yeah, yeah. So the, the criticism of Islam, of Muhammad or the Quran, is called Sab al-Rasul, right? So basically, there's a book by Ibn Tamir called The Unsheathed Sword Against Those Who Rightfully Call Moab Pedo right or something like that I'm, I'm sure i botched the title but it basically if you're a muslim or a non-muslim and you insult muhammad you must be killed we did that yeah. in the show previously we discussed that in the previous show we went in detail through that book and it's on my channel to have a look we can discuss that another time but yes so very important notice muslims will deny the sharia they will deny it they're forced to islam requires them the sharia requires them to deny the sharia so they will seek to deny and illegitimize any Sharia manuals you cite. They will refuse to provide the names of any manuals. And of course, any books and articles you'll find about the Sharia will very rarely identify the name of a manual. They will talk about the Sharia, but they won't name the manuals and they will definitely not quote directly out of the manual. They may misquote them, they will not quote them. So understand, you're not gonna get support. So to run through this, we've done this before. If a Quran is purchased for someone who's... Uh, uh, hold on a second. Before you go on, there was a comment about the, the praying that I wanted to address. Mm -hmm. uh, Villainous said, this is why they take over the streets to pray. It's a dominance thing. Uh, I know that when we looked at uh, this passage or a similar one before, you put up images of Muslims filling the streets of Paris. Right. Um, and he, he's quite right, because you know they, they may not necessarily know the penalty, um, you know, not every Muslim has memorized the Sharia law, but they certainly know that people aren't supposed to pass in front of them. And by taking up the street, it's kind of saying you can't violate our laws. Right. It's a political act. It's not a religious act. That is political because it affects people who are not Muslims. Right. So if a Quran is purchased, it is obligatory the person be Muslim. The same is true of books that contain the works and deeds of the early Muslims. Quran in this context means any work that contains some of the Quran, even a slight amount. This is from the Sharia itself. So we are not supposed to know what the Islamic books say. The only time this is legal is if we are wanting to convert to Islam. Let's have a look. Again, we've discussed this before. 
giving directions to someone who wants to do wrong, but this is not the way that we understand this. It is not permissible to give directions to someone intending to perpetrate a sin. We are currently attempting to perpetrate a sin against Islam, right? By criticizing it. And because they would be helping us to commit disobedience. This is why they will never go into detail about their scholars. So teaching questions of sacred law to those learning it in bad faith, who do not want to learn the knowledge to apply it in their lives, in other words, convert, but for an unworthy purpose, this is us. This is why they can never reveal this information. It is illegal, right? And the, however, it goes on to say in the Sharia that permitting or authorizing a person to do something that impales disobedience or acceptance of disobedience is disobedience. So they're not allowed to permit to authorize any, it doesn't say just not Muslims, anybody to do something that entails disobedience because accepting disobedience is itself disobedience. They're told this. In, now, I don't want to go through every word and every page in the show. I've just grabbed the specific reference and you're welcome to read these for yourself in the books. But does that make sense? Definitely. Yes. Final one. Spying on the Muslims and revealing their weaknesses. This is effectively treason and you can be killed for it in Islam. If someone spying entails undermining Islam and its people, Remember, we're not supposed to be looking at their books, so we are spying, right? So just undermining Islam and its people, which is us. When Ali Dawa earlier was ranting about we are causing corruption in the land, corruption in Islam means temptation away from Islam. That's the literal meaning, temptation. So then he's one of those who strives for corruption in the land, and he is subject to death. I trust that's clear enough. Yeah, so, very. So we've got these multiple items in the Quran, in the Sharia, sorry, that tell us that, look, this is not supposed to happen and they are meant to kill us, right? So loving Allah, hating unbelievers. Now this is called, this is a doctrine called loyalty and disavowal. It's loving and hating for the sake of Allah. It's called al-wala al-bara. It is doing all that is pleasing to Allah and opposing what is displeasing to Allah. And this is what they're calling towards something other than submission to Allah. So if we call people away from Islam and towards Christianity, right, then we are doing something that's displeasing. This is corruption in the land. So loving for the sake of Allah means to love Allah and to show loyalty by following his Sharia. Now, if you look at the, right, by following the Sharia, it means to love all that is good and permissibly in the Quran and the Sunnah. This love requires one to defend Allah's religion and to preserve it. It is to love those who are obedient to, to Allah and defend and assist them. They have to work as a unit. But hating for the sake of Allah signifies showing anger to those who oppose Allah. And we oppose Allah. And those who oppose Allah, his messenger, his deen, and the believers. So all of Islam, the Muslims. All right, any questions or comments on that? No. All right. So... Al-Walla al-Barra, which is loving and hating for Allah, is one of Islam's, this is from this book, this is from a major scholar, he's a Salafi scholar, scholar called Fauzan. One of Islam's main foundations, namely the qualities of loving and hating, which are the two major prerequisites of true faith, or the Iman, what they, the faith in Islam. This is a manifestation of sincere love for Allah. So hating Christians is a manifestation of sincere love for Allah, his prophets, and your fellow Muslims. Al-Bara, on the other hand, is an expression of hatred, enmity, and hatred towards those falsehood, towards falsehood and its adherents. So Quran, sorry, Islam defines itself as the deen ul haq the deen of truth, the religion of truth. Christianity is the deen al-Bato, the deen of falsehood, the deen of vanity, the deen of worthlessness. And in fact, Bato means the false in Islam, and it's one of the names of Satan. So we follow the deen, the religion of Satan. And both of these are evidence of faith. So towards falsehood, they mean Christianity and Judaism here, and its adherents, they mean Christians and Jews and others. And also it forbids taking unbelievers as friends. And here we go in this book. The second, well, they call it integral, the people we should hate and take as enemies with no love or support and respect to them. And they learn this from this book, which describes this doctrine. And I'll be going to any questions. Ayo? Yeah, uh, so we do have a uh, good comment here um, from Ann Warren Nisa. I'm not sure if they're a Muslim or not, but the comment says opposing does not mean hating. Hate is a negative feeling and not a God loving trait. 
Uh, and of course, th that was said probably while you were still on the previous slide. Mm -hmm. uh, I, so you're right that the word opposing wouldn't automatically mean hatred, but when we look at the totality of the evidence, uh, right. it's pretty clear that hatred ha is in mind. No, hatred is very much implied. It certainly does mean hating. And yeah, I don't have time to go. We'd be here for hours if I went through every single. So I just want to cover this. So let's look at the Quran 551. Do not take the Jews and the Christians as allies. Whoever is an ally to them among you, then indeed he is one of them. Mm. Right. And Allah guides not the wrongdoing people. So let's have a look. A group of disbelievers, of believers who take them for friends, seeking their assistance and help is one of them. So any believers who take us as friends is one of us. Okay, and he's not included in Allah's protection and safety. Now, this is from Tafsir Ibn Abbas on Quran 551. So if you make friends with the Jews and Christians, you are not under the safety nor the guidance of Allah. Wow. Right? And don't forget, Allah guideth not to his religion, wrongdoing folk, the Jews and the Christians. Now, let's have a look. Whoever loves for Allah's sake and hates for Allah's sake and withholds for Allah's sake, Allah is an ally to him. Right. And then again, it's Tafsir Ibn Abbas. Now, what's interesting, I found this in multiple places referenced, but it is routinely quoted without a reference. There is no mm -hmm. reference to this. I'm, I'm assuming it's in Tafsir in Ibn Abbas's work somewhere, but I've not been able to find the actual reference to this. But this Do you think that goes point. back to like why they don't want people to see the sources and things like that, or is it just negligence? They routinely do not provide citations. This is actually very common. It's actually mm -hmm. really common. And often with Christian, when they when they quote biblical verses, they will mash them up, as that is not discovered. They'll mash three or four verses together, and you, it's kind of a mishmash of multiple of them. And they'll yeah. say the Bible says, and then like you're like, huh? The Bible <laughs> say that? Yeah, I, I think that it, it might be partially the you know there's no expectation that someone will look things up. Uh, they're not expected to look it up, so why give a reference? You're supposed to just believe it because the authority figure tells you. Uh, we did have a super uh, chat from Tippy Bear, uh, heart emoji, prayer emoji, and a cross emoji. Thank you very much, Tippy. I I'm allergic to those. Can you please put her in timeout? You don't got to read the emojis. <laughs> right. So now I, I could have said three emojis. <laughs> okay. So let's look at Tafsir Asra. Okay. Do not take the stranger as friend and do not approve of the enemy for your companionship. Right. So basically, only take Muslims as friend. Take the friend in Allah's work and approve of the companion in Allah's religion. Right. Remember, because they speak of you have to have enmity with the enemies of the religion. Seek them from friendship with God's friends and enmity. Seek enmities. Look for hatred. With the, these are your enemies with the enemies of the religion. And this guy, I believe, is Shia. Right. I think he's Shia. So, so this is common across Islam, Sunni and Shia. Let's have a look. Are you who believe? Now, this is Jalalain, Tafsir al Jalalain. Do not take Jews and Christians as friends, affiliating with them or showing affection. Whoever amongst the affiliates with them, he is one of them, counted with them. And then, of course, we have Tafsir ibn Kathir says, Allah, this is not, he entitles this the prohibition of taking the Jews, Christians, and enemies of Islam as friends. We are counted as enemies of Islam. Allah forbids his believing servants from having Jews and Christians as friends. They are enemies of Islam and its people. May Allah curse them. Wow. He gives a warning, threat to those who do this. Allah threatens those who do this. If any among you befriends them, then surely he is one of them. Right? So if you can find me tafsir that says otherwise to love your neighbor, I would love to see this. <laughs> right. Any comments so far on this? Uh, so we do have another comment from Anwar and Nisa. Um, here she says, Allah really all these refer to not going against all his rules and not to demean anyone. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm sure that they, the, <clears throat> the, the writers of the Sharia manual definitely agree that these are all about not going against all his rules, but the question isn't whether all the command of these things or not. The question is whether these things are good and just and fair and, more importantly, how these rules for today's subject, how the, all these rules influence actual Muslims to actually misbehave. And I, and I don't think Ibn Kathir could have made it any, could have put it any more bluntly about taking or about not taking them as friends. I don't think it's just not demeaning them. I think it's an active, positive command to, to not do something, to not 
befriend them, to not come alongside them. Um, it's pretty hard to escape the language from that. And that's why, as Lloyd has said, as both of you have said, these tafsirs and these secondary sources are so important outside of the Quran and the Hadiths, because then, yeah, you'd be able to tap dance around that, but it's so clear here. Yeah. And of course, they got, for instance, one of the, in this story that's told here, there's a Christian scribe that's really good at his job and this guy loves him. And Umar says, he is not, is he not pure? And he says, no, but he's Christian. So Umar admonished me and poked me and said, drive him out from Medina. Yeah. So yeah, they're not allowed to be there. Yeah, that, so, that definitely doesn't sound like just uh, not demeaning Christians to, to make them leave the country. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah exactly so what we have here is now we're going to quran 554 now of course this awala al-baro the doctrine of commanding the right to bidding the wrong it is a form of jihad it's a low level form of jihad for instance now we have we've got pictorial sai international yusuf ali it says stern towards disbelievers striving in the way of allah and fearing not the blame of any blamer powerful against the disbelievers they strive in the cause, cause of allah and do not fear the blame of a critic. They are mighty against the rejectors, that is us rejecting Islam, the disbelievers, us fighting in the way of Allah and never afraid of the reproaches of such as find fault. These are three different ways of writing this. Obviously, this is written basically with propaganda, but if you read Ibn Qayyim, right, Ibn Qayyim is one of the major scholars of Islam and he is one of the major founders of the polemics against Christianity. We covered him recently, we did a show on him. In his writing, he translates this as not stern, not powerful, not mighty, not harsh. Those are words that are typically used. He says they are violent towards disbelievers. Ibn Qayyim's translation is violent towards disbelievers. So we can tell that the Quran has been, shall we say, whitewashed a little bit. And striving in the way of Allah is just another term for jihad, right? But notice they are not to fear the blame of a critic. So they're taking a cue from this. Muhammad Ijab and all these people, they are not to fear the blame of a critic. That's why with uh, you've seen with um, Mr. Mr. Dida, right? Remember Thaddeus? I don't fear your blame. I don't, you know, it doesn't concern me because they're told, don't accept any criticism. Don't fear the blame of a critic. And let's have a look. Now they speak of, right? You establish Allah's law, you fight his enemies, and you enjoin righteousness and forbid evil. This is in Tafsir Ibn Kathir. Right. So we now have from the tafsir, so from the Quran and the Hadith, we now have the one of the major scholars of Islam telling us, and he's what's called a Sheikh al Islam, one of the 25 top scholars in history, recognized as one of the top scholars of Islam, utilizing this phrase, enjoining righteousness and forbidding evil, which is very much commanding the right and forbidding the wrong. So do not fear the blame of anyone for the sake of Allah. Do anything and you are not blamed. And I'll explain how this ties into the rest of it. So what is the fiqh, right? What the fiqh? So let's have a little primer on what this is. So the Sharia is the collection of values, principles derived from the Quran and the Sunnah, right? Typically that's the Hadith, can also be the Sira, that form the moral, religious, and legal teachings of Islam. It is distinguished from fiqh or jurisprudence, legal system, the law, which is the practical application of those principles in life. So the Sharia may be called the spirit of the law, while fiqh may be called the application of the law, the detail. So the values and the principles of the Sharia have been mentioned by many great Muslim scholars of the past. Qayyim wrote, verily, the Sharia is founded upon wisdom and welfare for the servants in this life and the afterlife. In its entirety, it is justice, mercy, benefit, and wisdom. Wonderful words. Every matter which abandons justice for tyranny, mercy for cruelty, or benefit for corruption and wisdom for foolishness is not a part of the Sharia. Even if it was introduced there in binding interpretation, and this actually has been watered down. So this is from this book by this guy or whatever. Let's continue and take a step forward. Uh, before you go on, uh, and Warren did have a comment on uh, fighting. He said, the fight was during the wars. Now who doesn't fight in war? Uh, we do have a... Two, two shows on Jihad, I, I suggest you check those out. But Lloyd, do you want to just briefly explain what kind of war Muslims are called to wage? Permanent war to establish Islam. We've done multiple shows and I've got this, this Sharia discussion is not going to be as detailed as some of the previous ones, but I want to lay a foundation. But unfortunately, 
Islam is permanently at war. Verse 9.5 and 9.29 of the Quran. And of course, if you look at the legal definition of jihad, it means to make war upon all non-Muslims for all time until Islam is established across the whole world and we are all made into dummies if we don't become Muslim. So exactly. unfortunately, there, there is no other definition if you look within the Sharia. Yeah, so, uh, according, according to you know, Orthodox Islam, yeah, Muslims are at a permanent state of war with all non-Muslims. The only way war will end is if everyone converts to Islam. So to say that you're only called to fight during the war, well, that means you're called to fight all the time. Indeed, you refer yeah. to the non-Muslim world as the house of war. Right. Uh, also uh, have a super chat from Skull Super that says, God bless you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm trying to build a small case, small little by little, to introduce you guys to these doctrines and how they tie from the Quran to the Hadith, to the Tafsir, to the Sharia, how they all tie together as one. And I want to give an understanding. I lived almost 11 years in the Middle East. I worked across the entire Middle East. And I want you to understand this is a different worldview. It's a different set of moral values. Allah the Exalted has made clear in the Sharia that the objective is the establishment of justice between his servants and fairness among the people. Whichever path leads to justice and fairness is part of Islam and can never oppose it. According to Ibn Qayyim, the values of the Sharia are as follows, justice, mercy, welfare, and wisdom. And then comes the kicker. And this is from, okay, so any Islamic law whose application contradicts these core values cannot be considered Sharia even if it is based upon the literal application of some verses of the Quran or the prophetic traditions. Yeah. Wow. That's very interesting. I know. I would, because I really, feel like, I feel like much of what we're going to see is going to contradict the, the, the values that they're laying down. So I don't know how exactly they go about this. I mean, even from just looking at the rules about prayer, there doesn't seem to be much mercy or, I don't know. Yeah. Maybe I'm just, maybe I'm just crazy. I don't know. <laughs> understand. But this is core doctrine of Islam. They said this yeah. is foundational in Islam. Right. So from these core values, scholars have derived the legal objectives of the Sharia that correspond with the welfare of human beings. I mean, we start looking at that welfare. But Thaddeus, your comment on this, on this highlighted section here. Uh, so any Islamic law who's Application contradicts these core values cannot be considered the Sharia, even if it's based upon the literal application of some verses of the Quran or the prophetic traditions. I think that pretty clearly says what the highest authority is. It is the opinion of the collected opinion of the scholars, yes. not your mm -hmm. personal interpretation of the Quran. Correct. Wow. Correct. That's very the Ijma, interesting. The consensus of the scholars, as I pointed out in the beginning. Yeah. So right so let's look further now al-ghazali as i said the number one scholar in islam after muhammad a sufi he wrote welfare which we mean here is the protection of the objectives of the sharia namely the objectives of the sharia are five the protection of religion life intellect family relations and property number one is the protection of islam everything that advances the protection of these fundamentals is considered benefit Everything which fails to protect them is considered corruption. Anything that advances Islam is considered a benefit, no matter what. Understand? So in this case, if you, if you consider this interpretation, lying, cheating, violence, all benefits Islam. That advances Anything Islam. goes. Anything yes, goes. Precisely. And we've covered that in previous shows. I've shown how the Sharia, that is the interpretation the scholars take from the Quran and Sunnah, that anything goes. Yeah, put another way, the end always justifies the means. Only Correct. the result matters, not how you got there. And I showed you guys in the previous show where we've got the rules from Sharani, which says that the end justifies the means, exactly. Mm. So Muslim scholars have regarded fiqh as the understanding of the Sharia and not the Sharia itself. So the fiqh is the application of the ideas and not the Sharia itself. Now, they will say, but hold on, we all diversify and we all think different things. The Sharia was harmonized by a man called Sha'ani, right? Who said, look, not all Muslims are equal. Not everyone's equally smart, works equally hard. And of course, so if someone does what he can, he's considered a good Muslim. And those who can do better should do better, right? So in other words, the underlying message was one of unity in reference to Sharia, but diversity with regard to fiqh. 
Like you might decide, you know, be hitting people. Or, yeah, I don't want to get blood all over me, so I won't do that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw them with rocks. I'm gonna kill them with rocks from a distance. Either way, you die. Just how you die, right? For instance, someone who, a woman who refuses to, uh, she becomes an apostate and refuses to return to Islam. Well, let's see. You can burn her. You can behead her. You could strangle her. You could stone her to death. You could cane her to death. You could whip her to death, or you could starve her to death. She can make just choice. That's great. Islam leaves you choices. That's fantastic. Women have choices. Last for creativity. Wow. Exactly. Right. So that is what they refer to. So Muslims have been commanded to unite upon the Sharia, but to be tolerant of each other regarding differences. So this is a point I want to make. There are differences, but they do not cancel each other out. They're not so radically different. Now let's get into the meat of this, and um, then we'll jump in. Now we're starting to jump into the Sharia itself. Right, so the obligation to command the right, and it's a communal obligation, etc., etc. So according to the Sharia itself, and based on the work of Al-Ghazali, okay, commanding the right and forbidding the wrong is the most important fundamental of the religion. It is the mission that Allah sent the prophets to fulfill. If it were not done, religion itself would vanish, dissolution appear, and the whole lands come to ruin. Right. Blessed be the word of Allah, apparently. So, Good times. <laughs> so the obligation to command the right. Let there be a group of you who call to good, commanding the right and forbidding the wrong for those of the successful. Quran 3104. Now, when they said, so we're talking about this, there's two kinds of obligations in Quran. Fad al-Ain and Fad kifaya. Communal obligation, a group obligation, and personal obligation. Like you're all meant to pray. That's Fad al-Ain personal or what they call universal obligation. Everyone has to do that. But jihad is a communal obligation. A group of people, a small committed minority has to do this because if they do not, then sin will fall upon the entire ummah. Mm. Then they're all guilty of a crime and guilty of sin. If you look through some of the older discussions on jihad that I've done with, with Thaddeus, in great detail, you'll find that laid out in detail. So let there be a source, that's Quran 3104. And just have a look at what Tafsir ibn Abbas has to say. They forbid disbelief. Muslims must forbid disbelief. So it's all disbelief? about thought control and just, wow. Yes. Uh, pause for a second here. Yeah. Uh, and Warren said, uh, if you guys want to hate, that's your problem. I'm out of here. Nah. Not word for word, but, uh, and you know, you, no one's hating here. We're just reading the sources. Uh, you know, don't take our word for it. Go ahead and look up the sources, read them for yourself and see if what we're saying is true. We're, yep. We have nothing to hide here. See, but look, this is why, this is why the, the tafsir and like these secondary sources are so important because look at what Anwarun just commented. They said, do good and forbid evil. All religion teaches that for a good living. And had you, and if you only had uh, uh, 3104, and that was all you knew. You could that could pass maybe, right? But then he, uh, Lloyd pulls out the tafsir from Ibn Abbas uh, Jalal. I don't even know how to pronounce that. Tafsir uh, Jalal line. Yeah. Tafsir yeah. Jalal line. And here he specifically says, uh, in the case of Ibn Abbas, uh, to do good would be to well, I don't know if it could be considered good or wrong, but one of those is to forbid disbelief, idolatry, and rejection. And that already takes you so much farther than say uh, Christianity would take you, because we allow for people to have free will and free choice. Uh, ultimately, we want to we want them to come through love and to see the truth. But this is a stark contrast. And so, I, as I've gone through these presentations through these weeks, I, I've really become this. Uh, I've really come to see the importance of looking at these secondary sources because it really does nail down a lot of the um, tap dancing that would normally happen when you talk with Muslims who want to um, try to escape these things. Right. Yeah, yeah. I, I'd also like to to come on on that real quick. Um, well, you know, if you say all religions. Um, forbid you from doing wrong things and tell you to do good things. Well, that's probably true in some sense, but they have a different idea of what is good and what is wrong. And more importantly, if uh, if you're saying all religions are just the same, then why are you saying Islam's better than any other yeah. religion? Why are you a so Muslim? Yeah. The Sharia defines good as not what your moral sense or your feelings or thoughts tell you is good. Good, and, it, and we've covered this again in detail on, on this channel and other shows, Good is what the Sharia tells you is good, and bad is what the Sharia tells you is bad, not your own personal view. That is no place in this. 
And I can go into that. That is in the Sharia, Section A, 1.4. Look it up yourself. Right. Uh, and one more thing, just a quick housekeeping before we move on. There is a war breaking out in the Skull Super household as Miss, Mrs. Skull Super didn't want to be outdone and also gave a super chat. God bless you all and thanks for your time and knowledge. All right. So, so the Muslims must forbid disbelief and rejection. We reject Islam and they must forbid that. They must forbid us from rejecting Islam. So let there be one community of you calling to good, to Islam. So calling to good is calling to Islam, not doing good, making people Muslim. That is good. Enjoining decency and forbidding indecency, commanding the right, forbidding the wrong. Those that call, bid, and forbid are the successful, the victorious. Now, victory is a term assigned to warfare. Since what is mentioned is a collective obligation, part of kifaya, and is not incumbent upon every individual of the community, for not every person, such as the ignorant, is up to it. So let's have a look. So what does the Sharia tell us about Quran 3104? This verse explains that commanding the right and forbidding the wrong are a communal rather than a personal obligation. For he says, let there be a group of you and not all of you command the right. So if enough people do it, meaning that whenever a wrong is seen, one of those who sees it corrects it. The responsibility is then lifted from the rest and those who perform it being expressly mentioned as the successful. There are many verses in the Holy Quran about commanding the right and forbidding the wrong. And we will soon start going into the very specifics of what they intend you to do. So, so the prophet said, those who keep within Allah's... So he's, he tells a story here about the Muslims are on, on the deck of the ship. And everyone else is in the bowels of the ship, right? And basically, they, we, we're going to make a hole in the ship and sink the ship. And the Muslims must prevent us from doing so. So we would all be destroyed... While if we were to help them, all would be saved. So we were going to sink the world. And unless the Muslims help us, we're going to sink the world. And thus they need to help us so we can all be saved. That's you, the know, you know how they'll help? They'll help by throwing us overboard. <laughs> so we aren't on the ship. Exactly. Crazy. Yeah. So whenever one of you sees something wrong, let him change it with his hand. Now, when they say with his hand, they mean by force. If unable to, change it with your tongue. And if unable to, with your heart. And that is the weakest degree of faith. So a real Muslim will speak out or he will use force. When you see my community too intimidated by an oppressor, tell him you're a tyrant. Have we ever been called tyrants? Has Dida ever used those terms on us? Has he ever said those words verbatim? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think he has. <laughs> I've seen it. They have to call me that. You may as well say goodbye to them, right? So command the right and forbid the wrong, or Allah will put the worst of you in charge of the best of you, and the best will supplicate to Allah and will be left unanswered. So if you don't do this, and we'll describe exactly what you're supposed to be doing very shortly, if you don't do this, Allah will no longer, he will turn his back on you. Right. Uh, so uh, this comment is slightly off topic, but I have a feeling it'll be the last comment from Anwarin. I think that uh, he probably actually yeah. has left the chat now. He says, good that you are good. It's the ultimate goal for people on earth and doing good has everything to doing good only in which code word is written. Doing good means hating. Bye bye. Um, so I'd just like to say a couple of things. You know, every religion except for Christianity, has kind of the same message, that you, sh you can do good by trying harder. You, you, you follow some prescribed rules, you, you try really hard, and if you fail, well, then you try again and you try harder. Christianity teaches a completely different message. It teaches the reality that we all fall short of even our own moral standards, that no person can be actually good in comparison to a all good God, and it offers us a, a real solution to that. And the real solution is not try harder. It is that God takes his righteousness and imputes it upon us. He views us as righteous for his own sake, not for anything we've done. Spot on, Thaddeus. Yeah, just, just one thing I'll add to that. I think Anwar is still in the chat, even though they haven't said anything. But um, yeah, I was just talking with my buddy about this last night. Uh, he's, he's kind of agnostic, deist, whatever. And I was explaining to him how, you know, all religions except for Christianity essentially teach that. And I said, 
you know, the mistake is thinking that just because you do good things, it overrides the bad. But if I murder someone, I can, I can donate to the Red Cross every day of my life, but that doesn't change the fact that I murdered someone. And if my God that I worship is holy and just, then he can't just let me walk off for that crime I committed. The judge is there to judge you for your crime, not for the good things that you do. And it's the same exact thing with God. And so to think that you can earn salvation, to think that you can just try harder and reach that goal is it, it's, it's foolish. And so just think of the logic of that and consider how in Islam, you really are in the, shink, the sinking ship because it, it becomes an endless triad of just trying to work more and more towards something that you could never attain in the first place. And so, and Warren, thank you for tuning in. You know, hopefully you stay and watch the rest, but I think those are some good words to leave you with. Right. Remember earlier where you can literally blind someone for looking at you or looking into your house without mm -hmm. permission? That is good. Muhammad yeah. did it. Is he going to say that that's evil because Muhammad did it? He cannot criticize Muhammad. He's not allowed to. He yeah. kill it. Now, I want to just, let's, since we're talking about this subject, it cannot be said that an act which the mind deems good is therefore good in the eyes of Allah, that we are called to do it and rewarded by Allah, or that whatever the mind feels to be bad is bad in the eyes of Allah, and we are not supposed to do it, and it's do it punished by Allah. The basic premise of this school of thought is that the lawgiver, who is synonymous with Allah or his messenger, and the Sharia yeah. literally makes Allah and Muhammad the same. Yeah is wow. good by permitting it. So has indicated is good by permitting it or asking it to be done. So if it appears in the Sunnah or the Quran, then it is good if they've asked for it to be done or they've permitted it. And that is what the lawgiver has indicated is bad by asking for it not to be done. But the good is not what reason considers good, nor the bad what reason considers bad. The measure of good and bad according to the school of thought is the sacred law, not reason. Wow. That. And already off of that, you can see contradictions because again, my mind just goes back to, and Thaddeus, you got to remind me of the name. I always forget her name, but the woman that um, uh, Muhammad slept with, that he, promised, that he promised he wouldn't, and then Allah gave him the revelation saying that he could. What was her name again? Mary the Copt. Yeah, Mary the Copt. Um, right there, you see a kind of conflict of interest. I mean, on one hand, Muhammad's saying that it was good for him to, to, to stay away and to promise that he would you know, not sleep with her. And yet Allah comes along and says, no, this is good. And so you have the Sharia on one hand saying that they're both equal, but yet even when we look at their own sources, they can't even make up their minds. And so more inconsistencies. Exactly so. Very well said. Yeah. So yeah, if you don't do what Allah says, he will not answer your prayers. He will reject you. So those who go astray will not harm you if you are guided. So they believe. So these apologists now believe that we, we're the ones who go astray. We cannot harm them if they are guided, that they are being righteous and no harm will befall them Will befall them because they are being guided by Allah, right? So this is what they actually believe. This informs the culture. So they believe they're immune, right? So they can do as they please because they are rightly guided. And remember, they talk about the rightly guided caliphs. This is endemic within the culture. And people who do not change something wrong when they see it are on the verge of a sweeping punishment from Allah. Allah threatens them. Remember we said earlier, Allah threatens you. So these are genuinely God-fearing people. And I, when I say God, I don't mean Yahweh, but they are genuinely pious people. Mm. And if you can reach them and convert them to Christianity, you make very powerful Christians. Yeah, that's so true. That's a great point. Right. So they take this stuff seriously. So do it or Allah will punish you. Now they speak of having the caliph's permission. Often I've been told, no, well, you have to get the caliph's permission. And in the Sharia, we hear Pew 2.3, some scholars stipulate that you must have permission to do so from the caliph. This is untrue for the Quranic verses and hadiths all indicate that whoever sees something wrong and does nothing has sinned. Stipulating that there must be permission from the caliph is mere arbitrary opinion. But, so we can see that the Quran, actually the Sharia, covers all of these bases that you know Muslims tell us things, but these bases are covered. Right. So we'll step forward. Now, we're going now into the specific detail that covers what they're supposed to do and how they're supposed to do it, which includes using violence to stop us, right? So the five levels of censure explain the nature of the wrong act. So they're supposed to tell us nicely. Then they must admonish politely. Now, admonish in the dictionary means to indicate duties or obligations to someone to express warning or disapproval in a gentle, earnest manner. That's the dictionary definition of admonish politely. 
sorry, my bad. Then the third step is to revile them with harshness. Reviling him and harshness. What does reviling mean? Let's have a look up. What does revile mean? To revile, subject to verbal abuse. Yeah. To revile means subject to verbal abuse. So let's see. Ask him politely and then swear at him. Yeah. Be abusive in your language. That's a very, you flip that switch and you go from zero to 100 right there. <laughs> These are the, and then you must forcibly stop the acts, for instance, by breaking musical instruments or pouring out wine. These are not the only examples. These are just examples of what you might do given the circumstance. So you can break things or destroy possessions. They're allowed to do this. And then the fifth step is intimidation and threatening to hit them or actually hitting them to stop them. Uh, this slide is, you know, really informative of the behavior we've been seeing from the Muslim apologists recently. We didn't necessarily notice when they were asking politely or whatnot, but we yeah. definitely noticed when they, they, they elevated it to harsh words and then more recently threats of violence. I think they just skip one and two entirely nowadays. They just go straight to three and go on. <laughs> yep. They go but it's so to true. I mean, it, it's, it really is insane how... I mean, however old these sources are, despite all these centuries later, it's, it's the same exact thing. And, and that says something about the roots. What'd you say? This is 800 years old. Wow. Maybe yeah. A Maybe a thousand. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> wow. yeah. Uh, before we move on, I did want to acknowledge a super sticker from the Lion of Christ uh, dancing pair. You are amazing. Thank you very much for that. Right. So in a sense of these, let's go back to the Sharia itself. So they speak of, speak, in, speak to him politely, then revile him, which is use abusive language and harshness, and then forcibly stopping the act, such as by breaking musical instruments or pouring out one, and finally intimidation and threatening to strike the person. That is directly out of the Sharia. The early Muslims' invariable practices of reprimanding those in authority decisively prove there is no need for a superior's authorization. You must have seen videos in France like Muslims going to liquor stores and just destroying the bottles, pouring out the wine, smashing the glass on the floor. This has happened. If it be wondered whether a child is entitled to reprove his father or wife or husband or for private citizens, the answer is we are all fundamentally entitled to. They're entitled to do this. And the child is entitled to explain the nature of the act, to admonish and advise the parents politely, and he may censure at the fourth level such as breaking things like a musical instrument for lute. Because remember, music's illegal in Islam pouring out wine, and so forth. This is also what may be done by a wife. So children may smash things if they disagree with what their parents are doing. Wow. Same. Yeah. Uh, Tippi pointed out that in the Arabic, there's no then, that it's just a list of things you can do. It's not necessarily a progression. Uh, it's kind of just oh, wow. implied that it's a progression. And, uh, you know, I don't know that for a that fact one way or another. Yeah. But it would be perfectly consistent with the famous wife feeding passage in the Quran. Um, we're, we're told that it's steps, but in fact, it's just a, a conjunctive list. These are the things you do. It's not you do one, and then if that doesn't work, you go to the next one. Right. Also, what if, just out of interest, I'm deliberately skipping a sentence in this section. I don't want people to say I misquoted things. I lied. I'm deliberately skipping a sentence here to see if the Muslims will look it up and cite the passage in full when they comment, just to see if they're willing to discuss this. There's a sentence I've left out. So let's, let's see if you guys are willing to actually finally quote something in full. Love to see it. Not going to happen, but, but love to see it. And now at this point, I'm going to go to the Sharia manual. We're going to be doing only about eight pages. And I'm going to go into the detail specifics, but hopefully I've laid a foundation to understand something of the culture without going into too much detail and depth. That was, that was great so far. Very clear progression. And I think you did a great job at establishing just you know, what exactly it is we're going to be examining while also looking at very specific commands and things that make it so clear why we're seeing what we see today. So already really good. Yep. Okay, so hopefully you guys have downloaded this. I'm not going to bring up. But before you go on to that, um, Raphael just joined, I, I believe, and uh, proceeded to quote a Quran verse. Uh, <laughs> and I just said in the chat, but I'm going to go ahead and say it out loud as well. 
uh, you know, thanks for quoting us the Quran, but we're talking about the authoritative interpretation of the Quran. Anyone can <laughs> the, the Quran, and that doesn't mean anything. So, you know, until you cite us a Muslim scholar who tells us what to think of that verse, uh, it's totally irrelevant. And then we have a super chat from the Lion of Christ. He says, I used to go by the username Rory Husky, 1988, but now I am the Lion of Christ because I am now a Christian and I was inspired by Proverbs 28, uh, 1 or maybe 11. It's one exclamation point, so I'm not sure which one. Uh, be abusive like Muhammad Burka did with dear brother David Wood, question mark. No. <laughs> I mean, look, Remember yeah. seeing Roy Husky around. Right. Yeah. I mean, hey, I'm happy to. Well, I know I rag on people. Good grief. I give people a hard time. But, but yeah. Uh, so just to be clear, uh, Rory, former Rory, real name Muhammad, is uh, a, a, a friend of mine. Um, and um, he did indeed. He is an ex-Muslim who has was a atheist, agnostic, um, deist, probably more of a deist for a long time, and right. maybe about two months ago accepted Christ as his personal savior. That's awesome, man. Well, welcome. Good to have you with us, Rory. I, I think I may have given you a hard time in the past. And, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, welcome. So let's have a look at this chapter on commanding the right and forbidding the wrong. Levels of censure, and it discusses lots of, there's a great deal of detail here, right? As I said, intimidation, assault, and force of arms. So yeah, this is, these are the steps that you take. So this discussion, it's Imam Ghazali's analysis, all right, one of the top scholars of Islam. And of course, we've covered some of this already. So whoever of you see something wrong, let him change it with his hand. If unable to, let him change it with his tongue. We've said that. This is the weakest degree of faith. So if you want to show real faith, using, you know, showing feeling about it, you know, having, having a bad feeling about it's not enough. You're supposed to take action, at least speak. And obviously the greatest degree of faith is to use force. So let me step forward. They discuss who may command the right and forbid the wrong. And they speak of legal responsibility. Remember, Islam's a legal religion. This is a legal responsibility. It's law, right? It's not just something that they made up. They are obliged to follow the law, right? So a child of the age of discrimination who condemns something dishonorable is rewarded for doing so, even if it's obligatory, not obligatory for them to do so. So you are rewarded. Allah rewards you for your actions. You are actually given a reward for doing so. Do you enjoin piety to others and forget yourselves? But now having the caliph's permission. Now we know that there is no need for permission from a higher authority. Any Muslim can take it upon himself to take such action, right? And we know, so a child is entitled to, to do all of these things. Sorry, what was the, you know what? Yeah. Now, this is where I want to begin. It is not, a, it's a, it is a necessary condition that the person condemning something wrong be able to do so, right? So this will be page, let me just see, this is page 717 in the book and in the PDF, I'm looking at page 735. It is a necessary condition that the person condemning something be able to do something about it. Someone who is unable is not obliged to condemn it except in his heart. So they have to hate it and they have to hate you. The obligation is not only lifted when physically unable, but also when one fears that problems will result for one, which also comes under the heading of inability. So you're required to do it, but of course you're not obliged to if you are unable to actually act upon it, or if you think there will be consequences that you will not be able to deal with, right? Then you have to hate it in your heart. So the obligation to censure the wrong is likewise lifted when one knows that the reproach will be ineffective. So if you don't think it's gonna be effective, don't do it, right? These are the rules that they provide. And four situations may be distinguished. When one knows the wrong will be eliminated by speaking or acting, Without impaining problems for yourself, one is obliged to censure it. Can you reword that? It sounds a little, I'm like having trouble following it. So when one knows that they can get rid of whatever the problem is without, without entailing consequences for themselves, 
Oh, it's like they, nothing will happen. Nothing bad will happen to them. Them, yeah. Then they have to censor. Okay, I see what you mean. Yeah, so they have to say so they know that they can eliminate the wrong, and this would be us criticizing Islam, right? If they know they can do so without incurring any consequences, any blowback to them, they're obliged to do so. When wow. one knows that speaking will be ineffective and one will be beaten, one is not obliged. To. Right. But when one knows that one censure will be ineffective, but it does not entail problems for one, it is recommended to censure the act in order to manifest the standards of Islam and remind people of their religion. So these are the rules that they're applying. And hadiths that seem to show the non-obligatoriness of commanding the right and forbidding the wrong are understood by Islamic scholars as referring to specific situations. So certain hadiths have very narrow definitions, very narrow situations they apply to, and they are not global statements. And so that's very interesting to know. Some of these hadiths are not, some, yeah, some hadiths are not global, but very, very specific. And commanding the right and forbidding the wrong will be obligatory until the day of judgment. So when one knows that it will cause problems for one, but the wrong will be eliminated by censoring it, such as with breaking a musical instrument or dumping out wine, then, and when one knows that one will not, will, will be beaten for it, then one is not obliged, but rather recommended to. So if you know that if you act, it will destroy the problem, remove the problem, but, and, and this is by breaking damaging goods, damaging people's property, but you know you'll be hurt for it, physically beaten, then you're not obliged to, but you reckon, it's recommended you do. And this is from the jihad, from the hadith, the best jihad is speaking the truth to an unjust ruler. So very interesting, we always quoted this, the best jihad is speaking the truth to an unjust ruler. So the application of this hadith is not just in terms of a ruler, it is anyone who is doing something that is contrary to Islamic law. Wow. Your thoughts, studies? Yeah, I mean, this is pretty interesting. You, you kind of see uh, the, well, the, the pattern that we were referring to before kind of being made more explicit that, you know, if you can be nice, then by all means be nice. But if you can't get your point across by being nice, then you need to elevate it to another level. Right. I, I don't want to, I don't want to full on say this yet either, just because I know that technically they didn't, but even with those uh, statements above, you can see how close they come to um, standing over the Hadith essentially in authority saying, no, this is how they're traditionally seen, but we're saying this regarding how you should uh, uh, command the right and do the, and, 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 and stop wrong. wrong. And so it's notice what I've said before, the Ijma is the primary form of, of legislation in Islam, the primary authority. And basically that is what the scholars say Islam is. What the scholars say Muhammad said, what the scholars say the Quran said. Not what they say, but what the scholars say they say. Yeah. I've said this before. And they're saying the best yard is speaking the truth to an unjust ruler, but the scholars are saying, bugger that. You know, this applies in general. It's a general. This is global. This is actually saying, no, it's not just a ruler. It's anybody. There is no disagreement among scholars that it is permissible for a single Muslim to attack battle lines of unbelievers headlong and fight them, even if he knows he will be killed. But if one knows it will not hurt them, such as if a blind man were to hurl himself against them, then it is unlawful. Likewise, if someone who is alone sees a corrupt person with a bottle of wine beside him and a sword in his hand, and he knows that the person will chop his neck if he censures him for drinking. It's not permissible to do so, as it would not entail any religious advantage worth giving one's life for. Which okay. implies there are religious advantages worth dying for. Yeah, so yeah. This, this is rather interesting. That, you know, you should, you should attack the, the enemy physically, even if you have no hope of success, unless you know for sure that you can't do them any harm whatsoever then it would be a waste of your time and a waste of your life but so so that that's the value of your life in islam i suppose that if 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 you can uh cut the the enemy like literally cut someone and make him bleed well you did some harm so that's the just the value of your life if you ha can't do any harm it, it it'll just laugh at you and, and uh kill you as you try to attack him well then don't do that because your life is worth a little more than nothing, but it's not worth a lot. But it also says that you should do harm. That has value. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. I, I was talking to a, to a friend yesterday, um, just talking to, like, we were looking at everything going on with Menj and all these other, Muslim, all of Islam's finest, you know, these, these, these apologists. And uh, he said to me, he said, you know, it, it's like people really become radicalized because they basically decide that it's easier to die for God than to live for him. You know, they look at yeah. what low value they have within Islam and they say, well, if I'm going to maximize my chances at paradise, I've got to go all the way. And that's why you see, they think they conclude it's easier to, to die for him than to live for him. And that's really sad. You know, there's well, doesn't that say that if they were to die, but they were to do harm, they would be value in their actions. This aligns with that. Yeah. 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 And, you know, we, we also see that, that although this may not be the correct teaching of Islam, it is what most Muslims believe that, you know, there's kind of this scale that if you do enough good, it outweighs the bad you do. And if you've done something really bad, well, what could you possibly do to outweigh that? Well, the answer is anyone who dies in jihad is automatically supposedly going to heaven. So you can see why this would be a really fruitful message in, say, a prison system where people yeah. have done a lot of wrong things. And they're given this, you know, this religion that says, go ahead and keep doing the same kind of wrong things you're doing, but do them for Allah and he'll reward you with paradise. Right. I uh, did want to also read a super chat before we move on. Uh, also from the Lion of Christ. Uh, he says that he, this will be the last one because uh, he needs to pay his bills. But he noted that he was in the hospital from uh, July to August because when he first became a Christian, he faced some uh, uh, mental issues that made him want to immediately die physically uh, and go to heaven. And he had asked Christians to pray for that. Uh, he was able to get the healing he needed in the hospital and is doing better now. So we are very thankful for that. Right. Well, um, so sanctuary is only praiseworthy when you're able to eliminate the wrong and your actions will produce some benefit. Right. Now, of course, if your action is going to result in one's companions also being beaten, then it is not permissible to do so because you're incapable of removing something as blameworthy and then replacing it with another, right? That would be pointless. But when doing so will lead to a thing or to a state that is, because doing so will lead to a thing or state that is more reprehensible. So instead of you being beaten, all your friends will be beaten. Well, and don't do that because that's even worse, right? But Cowardice does not enter into consideration here, nor foolhardy courage, but rather the normal temperament of someone with a sound disposition. So they need a rational person to make rational decisions to do this, to rationally decide that doing harm and suffering consequences or violent consequences is rational. So they're requesting this, which this is really extreme. So now problems means being beaten, killed, robbed, or acquiring a bad name in town. As for being reviled and disparaged, it is not an excuse to remain silent. For someone who commands what is right generally meets with it. Right now, blameworthy. So they have to forbid what is blameworthy that exists at present and is apparent. Blameworthy means that its occurrence is prohibited by sacred law, by, by Sharia law. So they have to then act upon anything, right? So a parent excludes someone who conceals his disobedience at home. Now notice, a parent excludes someone who conceals his disobedience at home and locks his door. So if a Muslim drinks at home, right, this somehow, it is not permissible to spy upon him. So just an interesting way that they discuss this. I mean, does this gel with the way that we would view these kinds of actions in Christianity? Wow. So something that is manifest to another outside the home, such as the sound of pipes and lutes, you're allowed to go there and do something about it, right? Someone who hears them may enter his home and break the instruments. So if you hear the sound of pipes and lutes, someone who hears them may enter the house and break the instruments. Someone may enter your home and smash your possession. No warrant, no nothing, just... Right, if one smells the odor of wine outside the house, the sounder opinion is that it, that it is permissible to enter and condemn it. 
So when it talks, I'll go ahead. Go on, go on. I was just going to say, so earlier in the presentation, when we saw the uh, commands about not looking into someone in their home, that's assuming that they're not doing anything that's considered, you know, sinful or unlawful, correct? Because then the second you do, then all the gloves are off. They can come in, destroy whatever they need to. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Your thoughts on this, studies? Yeah. I mean, it's pretty, pretty crazy here. Um, we, we view religion as kind of a private matter. Uh, you need to totally eliminate that thought from your mind. If you're talking about Islam in a Muslim majority country, it's 100% a public matter. Everything you do is subject to correction, i.e. punishment by, from any other person. So it's, uh, it, pretty interesting there. And uh, Raphael said their God isn't omnipresent. That's why <laughs> they can hide. And I, I think that is very interesting that the, the public has to be on the lookout for someone drinking alcohol and needs to punish that person because apparently all this eternal punishment isn't good enough. Um, maybe because all they won't know they were drinking. Who knows? But notice they have to physically go in there and, and punish you. They have to take that action. They don't leave it up to Allah. They don't call the law. Remember, without the caliph's permission, they can smash into your home and attack you, destroy your possessions for committing a sin against Allah. This is ultimately Sharia law. I mean, so let's look at knowledge of the wrong acts. So the fourth integral is the censure itself, which is varying degrees of severity and has rules. The first degree consists of knowing the wrong act. One should not eavesdrop at another's house in order to hear the sounds of musical instruments. You should hear it by accident or try to catch the scent of wine or feel for an object concealed beneath someone's shirt to see if it is a flute. They really don't like music. Yeah. Nor should you ask a person's neighbor to see what he is doing. But if two witnesses come and inform you that someone is drinking, one may enter his house and take him to task. Wow. Yeah. So they try at least a little, they try to keep it at least a little candid, but still once it happens, the gloves are off. Yeah, exactly. And things will escalate. So you have to explain that something is wrong. The second degree consists of explaining that an act is wrong so that an ignorant person will often do something he does not know, but will stop when he's found out. Okay. People are not born scholars. We were unfamiliar with many things in sacred law until scholars mentioned them to us. Right. However, you then step forward right? Forbidding the act verbally. So the third degree of severity is to prohibit the act by admonition, advice, and making the other fear Allah, mentioning the hadiths of divine punishment for it, and reminding them how the early Muslims behaved. And of course, they're talking about Muslims here, right? So it should be done with sympathy and kindness, not harshness or anger. So you should break and enter with sympathy and kindness. So you should break, right? <laughs> So the great danger here is that one must be aware that a learned person explaining something is wrong may be proud of his knowledge and gloat. Excellent. That, that's fine stuff, right? But now censuring with harsh words. The fourth degree consists of reviling the person. In other words, using abusive language and bearing down on him with sharp, harsh words. One does not resort to this degree unless one is unable to present, prevent the person by politeness and he shows he wants to persist or he mocks one's admonition and advice. Reviling him, now again, it says here, does not mean vulgarity and lies, but rather saying, you degenerate, you idiot, you ignoramus, do you not fear Allah and so forth. Allah Most High quotes Abraham upon him peace saying, fie on you and what you worship apart from Allah, can you not think? Quran 21, 67. Oh, you know, we got some explicit instructions, exactly the type of, insults you're supposed to use you know being polite means calling someone a degenerate idiot ignoramus uh, which are somewhat <laughs> mutually exclusive there but uh, never mind that uh, so Ibrahim Javad says what channel have I come across is this what Jesus teaches you to do no wonder many people are leaving so um, you know obviously you haven't been paying attention but all we've uh. done is literally read word for word the Sharia law so if you're saying that there's something <laughs> disgusting in what we're saying, then you just called Islamic law disgusting. So uh, thank yep. you for that. This is orthodox Sunni Islam. So writing the wrong by hand. Let's see. 
The fifth degree consists of changing the blameworthy thing with one's hand, such as by breaking musical instruments, pouring out wine, or turning someone out of a house. Right? So and they speak of a wrongfully appropriated, whatever that means, but fine. But there are two rules for this degree. Not to do so when one can get the person to do it himself. Okay, so if you can leave land, he's unjustly taken. Do not drag or push him from it. And of course, this says that if he, otherwise you can drag or push him from it. Now, how is that a religious law? To drag people by the hair off land or something? I thought that's a political or legal act. But somehow this is religious. And then to break the instrument, for example, just enough to obviate they're being used for disobedience and no more. So don't <laughs> smash it completely. Just break it a little bit so you can't use it anymore. Or to be careful not to break the bottles when pouring out the wine. So you break into his house and then pour out his wine. <laughs> but notice, if someone is illegally in a house, then they should be thrown out. But you can, you can enter someone else's house. And smash his stuff and that's okay wow. now, if you cannot manage if you cannot manage except by throwing rocks at the bottles of the light <laughs> then you may do so and you're not obliged to cover the damages so i just imagine them standing outside through the window just target practice and oh my goodness yeah well muhammad threw rocks right he said if you throw rocks and blind someone it's okay well if you throw rocks and you smash the guy's stuff including what you wanted well maybe not you just smash the stuff in general you're not liable that hadith has now become law. Mm. So, yeah, understand. So let's look at now the next section, which is the religion of peace talking about intimidation. So we're nearly done here. Q5.7, the sixth degree, is threatening and intimidation, such as by saying, stop this or I will. And when possible, this should proceed. When possible, this should come before hitting the person. As Jesus said, First say, stop this or I'll punch you in the mouth. Was, was, that, was that in the gospel somewhere? Or was this Muhammad? I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't we, see think Ajaz, so. we see Ajaz emulating this perfectly with the doxing and all of this ridiculousness. Exactly. This is insane. So you should tell them, stop this or I will. And then you threaten them. And then you actually hit the person. So the rule for this is not to make a threat you cannot carry out. So do not make a threat you cannot carry out. How is this a religious instruction? Such as saying, I'll seize your house because you can't do that. Or I'll take your wife hostage. Unless you can take the wife hostage, in which case it is acceptable. Sounds like the manifesto of a crime syndicate. All the rules and the <laughs> do's and don'ts of like the mob or something, the Italian mob. I don't know. Yeah. But yeah, it, it, you make a good point though. Like it, it, we're, we're so far off from anything religious at this point. It, it, it just seems like a like a kind of personal vendetta that's written out like for some type yeah. of plan that used to be enacted it's it's interesting yeah if you say i'll take your house or i'll take your wife hostage because if one says this seriously it is unlawful and if not serious then you're lying hmm. whatever and then the next step is assault q 5.8 the same here we go is to directly hit or kick the person or similar measures that do not involve weapons this is permissible for private individuals which is fantastic. You may now physically assault someone to stop them from criticizing Muhammad or etc. The next section is force of arms. Go and get weapons. So the eighth degree is when one is unable to stop the act by yourself and it requires the armed assistance of others. So Hatim Tash was rather lucky. Oh yeah, yeah. That video so, was insane. Uh, yeah, sometimes the person being reproved may also get people to assist him. And then a skirmish may ensue. So the soundest legal opinion is that this degree requires authorization from the caliph. Remember, legal opinion, the soundest opinion, since it leads to strife and the outbreak of civil discord. Another view is that there is no need for the caliph's permission. So, you know, look, you know what? Get the caliph's permission, but if you don't want to, then don't do it and go, go, go start a gang fight. <laughs> So if you're going to let, let's sum that up, that um, one, you're supposed to threaten them, but only if you mean it. Don't threaten them if you don't mean it. Two, you're supposed to attack them personally. No need for ask permission for that. Just go hit the guy or whatever. And then three, get a gang to, to inflict more damage. Maybe ask for permission of that. Maybe not. Your choice. Yeah, exactly. 
exactly. And the attributes of the person that's entering, he must know the appropriate circumstances and their definitions and keep within lawful bounds. Now, remember, breaking into someone's house and physically attacking him is lawful. This is considered lawful. He must have good character. In other words, he must be able to break, enter, and assault. And yeah. <laughs> And the final section, I think, is this one, reducing one's dependence on others. Among the rules for commanding the right and forbidding the wrong is to depend less on others and eliminate desire for what they have so as not to compromise one's principles. So don't need anything from anyone else. And this story, and I'll end off here, a story is told when one of the early Muslims who used to get offal each day from the neighborhood butcher for his cat. He noticed something blameworthy about the butcher. So he turned home, got rid of his cat, before returning to reprimand the man who then said, from now on, I'm not giving you a thing for your cat. To which the man replied, I did not censure you till I gave up both the cat and any desire for what you have. And this is the fact of the matter. One cannot reprimand others as long as one is anxious for two things, the things people give one and their approval and praise. So and basically course, you don't want to, oh, go ahead, sorry. Uh, and the very final command is, as for politeness in commanding the right and forbidding the wrong, it is obligatory. Wow. So remember, break, enter, throw rocks, destroy, beat up, get friends, use weapons, get a gang, be polite. <laughs> and, and that last part was basically saying, like, don't allow them to have any sort of leverage over you. Yes. Right. Like, don't allow like them to give you anything that you want remove all that so then when you go after them there's nothing that they can do to essentially bribe you from enacting that censor censorship yeah correct crazy and they speak here nicely speak unto him gentle words quran 2044 except they're talking about when someone was speaking to pharaoh pharaoh could have right. had them killed you know mm -hmm. that's a powerful person so i will wrap up at this point and we can open it up for discussion and question but this yeah. is this is what this is about Yeah, so any comments or thoughts from anyone on that? So this is, I'll, I'll end off here. And, um, but that's what I have to share about this. I try to yeah, keep I, I just want to make, make a quick comment on that last slide there. You know, Muslims will happily quote us the, you have to be polite aspect, but they won't tell us how politeness is defined in Islam. So yeah, that, that sounded like a, a, a recipe for, as you said, um, what did you say, IO gang warfare or? Uh, oh, yeah, syndicate? crime syndicate or whatever. What's that one verse that uh, the media always cites whenever they try to defend Islam about how, like, if you kill one brother, it's as if you killed like a thousand? Five thirty-two and five thirty-three. Yeah. I mean, it's when you're, when you don't know the ideology, when you don't know the teachings, a verse like that usually can be good enough. But I mean, this just goes leaps and bounds farther than that surface level rhetoric that we often hear from celebrities and those who try to defend, you know, the, ide the ideology, very, this was a great presentation. That, you know, David did a number of debates with other Muslims in the past, and sometimes they would, you know, change the subject out around, change the rules at the last minute. And when he talked to Muslims about this, like, are you bothered that your guys did this? And they're like, no, you're an idiot for thinking that they would keep their word with you. You're oh. a kafir. <laughs> wow. You know, yeah, I, it's very hard for us to, to think that there's a culture that actually teaches this. Now, they may not explicitly know all these rules, but it is implicit within their behavior. They've been taught these ideas and they all, hopefully we can see their behavior and the parallels in this teaching that they are following this to the letter. Now, often the details are vague. It says, do, if you don't stop doing this, I will. They don't specify, so you make it up on the fly. But they do say, use violence. Use harsh language. And it's taken form, however it's taken form. And that's uh, Sharia, Sharia versus, it was fiqh? Fic? Or fic. How, how was it? Yeah, so the, the, applica the application. Yes. Lots of creativity there. Yeah, Allah Sorry. says forbid forbid the wrong, command the right, and the fifth is exactly how you must implement that. Definitely. So we have awesome. a, a few questions from the chat that we can address before we sign off. Uh, the first one is from God's Love. He said, did you see Mimi Hijab uh, going for David's wife and family? Uh, these guys are bullies. The example I used in the introduction was going after the apostate prophets, 
wife, but he, of course, has done it to other people as well. And then, you know, some people, even some Muslims, like, criticized him for attacking, you know, non-public figures, family members, and whatnot. And he's like, nope, they, they, they speak against Islam. They deserve this. Mm -hmm. Anything you guys would like to add to that? I would just say, you know, I don't think that this is the last of what we're going to see. So whether it's from Menj or Ijaz or Muhammad Hijab or Ali Dawar, whoever else comes on the scene, just definitely keep everything Lloyd's presented in your minds because it was a very good presentation, very uh, accessible, very to the point with the commands and the sources that he was citing from. And um, this will be a great opportunity to not just show Muslims, hey, this behavior is reprehensible, but to show how this is not just coming from these rogues or these rebels within Islam, but that this actually goes back to their most reliable and authoritative sources. Yeah. And uh, if we, the, the point isn't to just find it uh, entertaining. The point is to ultimately circle it back to Islam so that Muslims, such as uh, Anwar earlier, can see um, that the problem isn't with Menj or with Ijaz or any of these lone wolves, but the problem is with the ideology as a whole. Excellent. Very, Very well stated. Well yeah. Also, please understand, I really, a uh, gospel just asked me what Quran verses, I, I really referenced the Quran. Notice I only used, I think, three Quran verses yeah. in this presentation. And, but also notice that on those three Quran verses, I referenced about seven or eight or nine different books. So those three verses have inspired thousands of pages of work by scholars, literally thousands of pages, right? So understand that the scholars have taken these ideas and just run wild with them. And you will not find this in the Quran. You'll never find this in the Quran. You won't find the detailed description of what this hadith means in the hadith. You won't find it in the Quran. This is all found in the scholarly sources. And um, I barely find the Quran necessary. In fact, I barely look at it simply because all of the scholarly sources will provide the relevant Quran verse in them. The scholars don't need the Quran. They look at what the other scholars said on that topic because they are specialists in various topics. They'll go to that scholar, they'll go to that book, and he will cite the relevant verses and ideas, and you'll find it there. The, the scholars really, I mean, if all the Qurans disappeared right now, the scholars wouldn't care. And you will also notice that very few verses are used as source for, the, for these doctrines. They don't need the whole Quran, they just took one or two verses and said, okay, that's it. And here's several books worth of doctrine. Yeah, yeah, it's and crazy so, stuff. And so if bigger channels like, you know, David and, you know, the others started using these sources more would really help to just eliminate a lot of the tap dancing that we see. Um, so yeah, hopefully that'll happen. Absolutely. Uh, we have a question from uh, DHC21. It says, uh, it seems that this behavior is limited to places where Mohammedan Muslims appear to be in larger numbers. Is that correct? So, uh, so, the, so the question is, you know, uh, these more extreme measures of, you know, attacking people physically and whatnot, are those limited to Muslim majority countries or at least areas? Areas with Muslim. So, okay, remember, if there's one Muslim and he decides to attack or arrest people, he's under threat of harm, right? And it says if you're going to do something and there's harm to you, don't do it, right? But it says if you've got a gang and you can get away with it, go for it. Break and enter, assault. That's that's simply it. As long as you can get away with it, if you can have the numbers, act as a gang. And it says act as a gang. So yeah, if you can get away with it, do it. I believe that. Would you say? Would you guys say that's an, that's a a takeaway from what we've seen in the last section? If you can get away with it, do it. Yeah. So much. So many of the commands were about self-preservation and making sure that you could do it without uh, sustaining any uh, consequences to yourself. And many of these Muslim apologists, you know, they hide behind their fan base, they hide behind their, the internet, they hide behind a screen. And so this is the new version of that. They can, they can preserve themselves by talking a big talk and, you know, getting donations and drumming up a crowd, but it never really goes beyond that. At least I pray it does. Mm, but, these, but they will, once they get, as they get yeah. longer, there are more rules. Yeah, Remember, yeah. this is a low level jihad. This is within social situations. There are jihad rules for once you have greater numbers and access to weapons and you can credibly, effectively fight guerrilla war. Absolutely. Uh, comment from God's Love saying it's happening again to Hatoon, Speaker's Corner, 
is threatened in the United Kingdom. And absolutely, I, you know, not everyone's probably heard about that, but uh, Hatoon on the uh, 13th of September had to be escorted out of Speaker's Corner, not because of anything she did, but because there was a very large and threatening crowd and the police felt they could not guarantee her safety by any way other than removing her. Unfortunately, uh, you know, I, I don't blame the police. I think that they were trying to act in her best interest, but unfortunately what this does is it sends the message, if you have a large enough crowd, you can do whatever you want. And that's yeah. obviously a really severe problem. Correct, they've succeeded. But do you see the parallel again with that behavior and what we've just read out, what they're supposed to do? Yeah, uh, I completely see it. It was crystal clear, especially now. Yeah, and again, you're not going to find this in the Quran. Look, honestly, in my opinion, the Quran's irrelevant. I know I say this a lot, but, you know, with qualifications, I guess, but I need I take this point and, and let's, Thaddeus, I love to talk to Thaddeus first, and I should, because he gives me really good advice, and he says things sometimes better than I, than I do, because I tend to speak off, you know, off the cuff, and I should really consult with him first, <laughs> but if you know the Quran, you don't know Islam. You might not have a clue about Islam. Islam is not the Quran. It might be the source, the genesis, the seed. But you only, if you know the Quran, you only know the Quran. You don't know Islam. Islam is hundreds of books. Yeah, you don't see the seed. You see the plant that comes up. And that's all the secondary sources. Yeah. It's so true. Definitely. Uh, I have a comment here from Gospel Edge. He says, you should put these kind of videos with a title, Sharia Quick Guide, Sharia in Five Minutes, etc. A uh, kind of encouragement to break this up into smaller bites so people can digest it. Definitely take that into consideration and you know, maybe try to pull out some aspects of this video. Um, I'm really, really glad to hear that you find the material useful enough that you want to hear more about it or you know, mm -hmm. have it in a more easily referenceable format. So we'll definitely consider doing yeah. that. I have a question that did come up from Tippy Bear. Look, People tap dance, they tap dance around the Quran, but the Sharia is very specific, extremely detailed. There is no tap dancing. It is the final interpretation of the Quran from the top scholars. Now they lie about it, they always do. However, how do we, as a strategy, prevent the tap dancing? How do we paint them into that corner? Right? How do we use this information? And also I want to thank so many of you. There's so many of you that I learned so much from you guys as well. Your comments, your thoughts, your support, because you know, you know how active I am in the, I am a little OCD in the YouTube chat, as you guys know, more than a little OCD. <laughs> little tiny bit more than a little, but I learn a lot from you guys and it's really helpful because I that actually helps me to understand the work better and it actually really is helpful. So keep doing it, thank you. Just a couple more comments and then we can wrap it up. Uh, Red Moop said, I would like to hear you guys discuss the apology of Al Kindi if you haven't done so already. Uh, I do believe that that was a subject that Lloyd had expressed interest to me about. I'm not 100% certain, but. Yeah. Well, Thaddeus and I have been discussing, I've got probably like two dozen, three dozen presentations ready to go, and we just haven't had time. <laughs> you know, we just, everything just like we did the, we did the Dawa, that was five sessions. We expected one or two, we did five. We did, you know, I mean, so I, I could literally do a dozen episodes just on Jihad. So I have dozens of, you know, it's just really hard. Where do you really start? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, thank you guys for the encouragement. Um, you know, we, we've been seeing a lot of uh, momentum picking up on these series. When we first started them, they were uh, among the, the less popular videos on my channel. But as we've been going, they're becoming more and more popular. So I think that people are kind of, you know, realizing that Lloyd has a lot to offer and are really appreciating all the sources he's bringing. So we're going to keep doing them. Uh, Ophel Ian said, I'm happy most Muslims don't read this. So in regards to that, I would say two things. One, I mean, it is kind of good that most Muslims don't have this at the front of their mind. But on the other hand, it's kind of bad because they subconsciously absorb aspects of it from, you know, what they hear their leaders saying. They, they don't literally go and read it, but they absorb a lot of the aspects of it. I know that it's extremely common in Muslim majority regions for um, Muslims to sit around and, you know, in casual conversations and talk about how evil Christians are and how they need to eliminate the 
scourge upon the earth that is Christianity and whatnot. So they might not literally read the Sharia law and see the legal justification for it, but they certainly absorb the mindset. Anything you guys would like to add to that? I think that's well said. You know, I'm just curious about how do we stop them tap dancing? How do we use this information more effectively? But yeah, it is, it is tough. They'll always tap dance, but men, I mean, Thaddeus, remember even our last stream when uh, you, you went back and forth in the comments with that one person and then you brought out the secondary sources and didn't they delete their whole thread? Yes. You know, so the point is, you'll never know how they're going to react, but that right there is evidence that at least there's a chance. And that honestly is good enough for me. But it doesn't, if look, if all of us were throwing this at them, where yeah. are they going to hide? Yeah, it's true. No, nowhere. There's nowhere. They'll just have to lie and say it's not true, but they can't tap dance and say it means something else, at least. You know? yeah, but they can't bring us. I'd like to bring me a source in Islam that says to love thy Christian neighbor. <laughs> I'll take one. It's so simple, but yeah, we know it's not there. Oh my goodness. So we have, <laughs> sorry, uh, we do have a, a question that I think is a, a good question from Enza in 1965. Is the physical aggression purely because of the uh, Sharia law or is it also because of other things? Well, Allah requires, Allah is a God of punishment. He requires violence. And Muhammad, his sunnah, Muhammad is a violent man. And the Sharia is simply a reflection of Muhammad's life and Allah's commands. So therefore, yes, and the Sharia just codifies that. And the fiqh then applies that. So yeah, and of course, the doctrine of al-wala al-bara, which means they have to hate us. If we go into Ibn Taymiyyah, you, who's the expert in Islam on jihad, is the foremost jihad expert, you read his stuff, good grief, good grief. That is hatred of non-Muslims. It's crazy. Definitely. I uh, got a couple more comments that just came in, so we'll stay on there a couple minutes. Uh, Farouk says that he hasn't heard anyone else go into detail other than Lloyd, or uh, detail on the Sharia, I mean, other than Lloyd. And uh, that's true. We haven't really heard anyone else talking about this. We'd like to get more people talking about it, though, because we've seen how effective it is when you, you use this with Muslims, because, you know, as long as you're talking about the Quran, they can cite 10 different interpretations of it and you have no idea which one's authoritative but when you go to the sharia there's no more denying it uh, unless they want to blatantly lie uh, lord shardik asked do you think the future of islam will be bad um, that's kind of an ambiguous word but if I'll, I'll just say what i think the future of islam is and i think that it is going to collapse there's going to be large numbers of apostates in the near future uh, I think it's already happening and we just don't know it because when, you know, 3% of the population in, in a 100% Muslim country has left, it's really hard for those 3% to say anything. When 10% has left, it's still really hard. But when you get to, you know, 25, 30%, suddenly people will feel safe admitting that they've left Islam. And then we'll see overnight that, you know, and a country's gone from 100% Muslim to 70% Muslim. And then five years later, we might see it's 40% Muslim because then a whole bunch more people will leave when they start thinking, you know, maybe I really should look to, at this religion and see if it's really true and not just blindly follow it because everyone does. Anything you guys like to add to that? I mean, I mean, I think, yeah, I think it will. I mean, we only really see it digitally. I mean, just through people who reach out and say, hey, I'm an ex-Muslim. Um, but I definitely think that it's already underway. And then, yeah, you know, I mean, when you look at the demographics five, 10, 15 years from now, uh, there definitely will be a different story just because of all these discoveries that are coming out about, you know, seventh century Islam. Um, you know, Jay Smith's doing a lot about that. Yeah. And then also just looking at the behavior of the, of, as I said, Islam's finest. Um, it only gets worse. There's no, I mean, cause think about it, just think about five years ago to now it's only gotten worse. And so give it another five and see where we're at. So. Yeah. I think there are more apostates than one would realize. I think they just can't reveal it, but I, I suspect if the apostasy laws were removed, I think you'd see a flood leaving Islam overnight. Yeah. And you know, some of the Islamic scholars even say the same thing when someone says, why yeah, go ahead. I need to add. But uh, here's, here's where we, okay. Muslims are very pious. They really believe in their religion. They are very good religious people. 
right? And as I said, if they become Christians, they become very, very potent Christians. They really evangelize. And we as Christians, we have one serious flaw. They have a very strong sense of community. They come from very strong families, very strong communities. And when they apostatize, they've got nowhere to go. They're isolated, they're alone, they are they are at risk of violence and also they've got nowhere to go. And we as Christians, as Christian communities, we give them nowhere to go. We don't invite them to church. We don't invite, in fact, people don't say, hey, come to church with us, just, just that. But when they apostatize, we don't give them a community to go to. Go to. We don't give them a home to, to turn to. This is a mistake. If you provided them that safe haven, they would feel safer. They wouldn't become atheists. They would come home to your community, your church. So keep that in mind. This is a, this is a critical thing from our side. It's well said. Yeah, that, there was a, a couple other comments, but I think that I'd rather end on that note. Um, you know, when we, we see uh, a legitimate convert to Islam, you know, there's lots of people who are just tricked into saying the Shahada and don't actually convert. But when you see a legitimate convert, it's usually because of the sense of community. And that's kind of a, a failing on our part that the Christian church is not providing that community in many cases. Mm -hmm. So uh, take this material, apply it, use it to talk to Muslims, but don't forget to invite them to your church. I mean, what's the worst that could happen? They say no. I mean, big deal. So, mm -hmm. so when you're talk, talking to Muslims in your life, say, you know, why don't, why don't you just come to church with me th this Sunday? Uh, see what it's like. So thank you all for joining us today. Um, keep an eye out for another announcement about what we'll do next. We might continue our series on how the Sierra literature deifies Muhammad, or we might address something else, but I'm sure we'll do more videos in the near future. As Lloyd says, he's got tons of presentations that he's ready to share. Uh, so we'll definitely have him on and continue to share those. Thank you all. And God bless and have a great rest of your day.